I'm joined by just an incredible panel. I didn't introduce myself. I'm Ina Freed, Chief Technology Correspondent at Axios. Um, what I thought to do instead of uh, waste any of our precious time on introductions is just have everyone instead sort of talk about when we talk about AI and jobs, how do you come at this? What are, what are the first few things uh, that come to mind for you and that can serve uh, as both an introduction and a starting point for our discussion? So I'd love to start uh, to my left, Lauren. Thanks, I'm Lauren Woodman, I'm CEO of Datakind and Datakind is a nonprofit that uh, develops data science and AI for the use in a wide variety of, uh, of social impact or uh, social impact sectors. I, I look at it from sort of two issues, uh, from two different ways. Um, one, you know, frankly, just having spent a long time working in nonprofits and education and policy and humanitarian response, I worry about the disruption that is potentially coming and whether or not we are we are training folks to to be successful in the next generation. I have no fears of, of what's going to happen. I mean, this is the technology progresses, technology can be used for good. I, I'm an optimist when it comes to those types of things. But the transition periods I always worry about and, and are we preparing um, government, society, community to do that and are we prepared to help support people through that transition? The other thing I think about a lot is in the sector in which I work, are we actually helping uh, you know, the organizations that make communities thrive, are we helping them think about how their work is gonna be disrupted and how we deploy these tools against those problems? Because they could be incredibly powerful um, and incredibly impactful in helping us make progress. And we hear, you know, your company kind of bridges uh, two of the areas. You know, when we first started talking about AI, uh, sorry, um, automation, uh, we thought, you know, it was everyone else's jobs they were coming from. And all the folks in this room, we were like, Automation's wonderful, it's gonna make my company better. And then all of a sudden we realize, oh, it's, you know, AI is coming for our jobs too, it, in one sense. Um, talk about, uh, you're kind of leading the charge on that front. Talk about what you're doing and what your company does and, and some of the things that AI is already doing. Thank you, uh, uh, gl glad to be here. Uh, Mihir Shukla, CEO and founder, Automation Anywhere. It's a AI and robotic process automation company. Uh, we have 5,000 customers in over 90 countries. We today run about 100 million processes with AI, and that is growing double digits every month. So if you think AI is coming, it is already here. Um, so what kind of things that we do that weren't possible before? Maybe that would be a good way to level set it. So if you, if you think about the world, there are about billion knowledge workers. These are the people who are sitting in front of computers either processing mortgage applications or healthcare claims or supply chain request. All of us who sit, you know, a considerable amount of time in front of a computer doing our job. And the way many of us do that job is we get the data from emails and everywhere else, and then we have about 18,000 different applications. We input stuff and make some decisions along the way. Uh, all of this was not possible to automate because it's just a huge universe of 18,000 applications and too many variations. Uh, what has changed in the last many years is with the help of AI and robotic process automation, now software bots are able to operate all applications. Uh, they look at an application, there are forms and fills, and they can execute a process end to end. Um, so a mortgage example, a mortgage application that used to take 30 days could now, you fit all the data, it will take all the data, make decisions, type it, type it into all applications, and in three minutes you're done. Uh, so if you step back, about 15, anywhere from 15 to 70% of all the work that we do in front of a computer could now be automated. Mm -hmm. It is truly a watershed moment mm -hmm. that's happening uh, now, the good part is that I don't know of anybody who wakes up and says, my mission is to process invoices or healthcare things. <laughs> so when I meet these people who are using this, they are delighted. Uh, it is a human bot partnership where I, I offload some work to the bot and then I do what I do. So I'm very optimistic about the future. I, I think transition would be, uh, all transitions are challenging. And a key in this transition is reskilling. One quick follow-up, um, for your customers, are they mostly re uh, reducing the number of workers they have doing those things, or are they finding new work for those same workers to do? Uh, what is happening, uh, uh, that's a great question. What is happening is uh, when you process mortgage application instead of 30 days in four minutes, 
you end up processing a lot more of it and you gain market share. So this is about doing more. Uh, the other thing I would point out is that out of 100 million processes that we run, we estimate about 20% of it is the things that we never did before. Because either it was not technologically possible or economically not viable. In another three to four years, I estimate that to be 40%. That means 40% of the new things, there are new products, new services, better quality of service, better quality of life. We forget technology is not about doing things, but existing things better, cheaper, faster. It's about doing things that we never did before. Great, and Eric, I know uh, your work uh, at Samarin, you know, is all about sort of you know, human-centered AI mm -hmm. um, and sort of what is the role um, you know, help us, help us, you know, share your, your, you and your colleagues are, are doing a ton of work. What, what should we know about this topic? Sure. Well, well first, but, but I agree very much with what Mihir and, and Lauren was saying. Um, but first, let me just congratulate all of you. It's nine o'clock in the morning on a Friday, the last day of, of Davos, and it's standing room only here. And it, it underscores what you said at the beginning about how important this topic is. And it, it, um, it reminds me of a, of a similar session a, a few years ago uh, when we looked at, at deep learning and, uh, and uh, Mark Benioff had one of his amazing parties and I left it, you know, a little after midnight, I think. Um, he was still there and then he was on the panel with me and uh, I turned to him and said, well, so what time did you finally leave? You know, it was an mor early morning panel and he said, Without missing a beat, oh, I just came right over. I didn't, I didn't uh, go to bed. <laughs> so um, um, I don't know how many of you guys did the same thing there. I hope you at least changed your shirt. Um, but, um, but this is a similar, as Ina was saying, a similar uh, inflection point in terms of the, the uh, power. The deep learning revolution really set off all this interest in AI um, over the past decade or so. And now I believe we have a similarly important set of changes with generative AI and with some of what we call them foundation models at Stanford. Um, Andy McAfee and I have been talking about this exponential improvement in the technology and how our labor, our institutions, our skills, our organizations aren't keeping up and there's a growing gap. I'm not sure exponential is the right metaphor anymore. I'm beginning to think it's more like punctuated equilibrium because this is like a, a burst forward of, of, of capabilities. And they build on top of the other ones. It's not like the other ones have gone away. Um, and, 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 uh, there's always a, a wave of concern and fear about job loss and, 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 and uh, whether or not uh, there's going to be mass unemployment. In fact, unemployment is at a record low right now, and so it's not really uh, eliminating uh, tens of millions of jobs or anything. What it's doing is it's affecting job quality and changing the way that we do the work. One of the things that um, we're looking at at Stanford, as, as Ina mentioned, is keeping humans in the loop and the way that that can be done in a way that uh, makes the work more fulfilling and maybe gets rid of some of the boring routine work of, of, of filling out invoices or whatever. And people can focus on some of the more interesting human-centered parts and connecting. Um, that doesn't always happen. And I think that there's a, an opportunity there to use the technology in lots of different ways. And one of the things that will be interesting to see over the next decade is to what extent we do keep humans in the loop and, and work on creating higher job quality and not simply looking at doing more of the same uh, more cheaply or, or driving down wages. Um, either path is possible, but I think one of them most of us would like to see as the path we do uh, going forward for the next decade. You just, just, so so you're the implication of what you said is it's uh, blue collar, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now, what about white collar? Because the, the yeah. real issue, the real well, issue I think is how far this is going to go, how far up the value chain well, are the best way and, to put it. And that's why I'm so glad you're on the panel, Martin, because your industry is actually the one that I think is going to be changed the most <laughs> dramatically in the next couple of years, or one of the ones that's going to change yeah, first. I, don't, I, I wouldn't single out, uh, you, you're going to spread a lot of fear out there by saying what well, you just... Well, let, let me tell you some of what I know will be possible, yeah. and then I want to hear how you're already using it. So I know today... Um, you're going to be able to use the combination of the image and video generators and sure. the text generators, you know, to have a story idea, sure. a commercial idea, and say, um, imagine, uh, you know, you're doing a commercial for BMW. Yeah. A BMW is driving through the snowy streets of Davos um, when a deer comes and uh, the car uh, uh, breaks and... Uh, sends an email to blah blah blah. Anyway, not only will it be able, it'll be able to. You wouldn't not make just it storyboard as a it. copywriter. I don't think I'm the best. <laughs> yeah. um, not only will it be able to copy. Uh, no, no, sorry. No, no, but but I think just so we're 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 a digital 
disruptor, I guess is the best. We started four years ago. We have 9,000 people in 32 countries. Um, very tech focused, about 50% of our revenues come from, from tech. Um, we're always looking for disruptive technologies and disruptive ways of doing it. And, and just to come back to what you just said, the uh, con sort of conventional wisdom is it will affect copywriting, art, the creative processes. And we've had a, an example, actually, I think it was about two years ago, actually, out of Russia, where there was this design style that became very, very popular. They thought it came out of a small design agency, human, and it turned out to be a bot. So, yep. um, so a famous example. But I think the really most interesting area, and it kept, there's why I sort of picked you up on that, that question of white collar, blue collar, is I think the biggest impact that <coughs> is not going to be, it will be on the creative side of yep. the business, but it will be in the data and analytics and digital media side of the business. So, so it's um, an $800 billion industry, the media industry, of which um, digital is currently two thirds, predicted to go to three quarters by 2025. So media planning and buying, which is a, a process or a set of processes which are, are algorithmically driven or lend themselves to algorithmic uh, analysis, is an area which is, which is very human driven. In fact, if you went back a few years ago, uh, when the platform started to de develop like Google and Meta and Amazon, the, the conventional wisdom was, and when I was running WPP, that we would be disintermediated by those, those platforms. It didn't happen. And the reason why was that Google's business was not in employing people, mm -hmm. or Meta's business was not in employing people, and they didn't want to go into a service business because they were very labor efficient mm -hmm. and capital intensive. That's the big change. Now, you will be able to automate the media planning and buying process in a highly effective way. It's become more digital, which lends itself to it as well. And there are more permutations. You know, this morning you hear about Netflix, you've got Disney coming in, you've got Apple and Microsoft. It's going to be a very highly competitive area as well from a technology point of view. You've already got Microsoft in there. You've got Google, for example, here, talking about how their models now are even more sophisticated than you heard, heard in the context of open AI. So my prediction would be that the media planning and buying business, which is the guts of the so-called holding company profitability uh, and base, will be disintermediated, disintermediated very significantly. It may take about five years. The, the people on the panel will know much better than I do how long this will take. It'll, it may take five to seven years, but it's going to re revolutionize. So you will not be dependent as a client on a 25-year-old media planner or buyer who has limited experience, but you'll be able to pull the data. That's the big change. And that's, I think, the real issue that everybody is focused on and worried about. Because are we, we might be displacing you know, um, mortgage applications or speeding up the process and creating better intellectual capacity for workers as a result. But the real issue is how far up does it affect people at senior levels in agencies? And I think the answer is going to be at will. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. Eric, I'm curious, um, you know, what are the things that we should be watching out for where um, the AI may be good, but not sufficient? And there's two areas that come to mind. One is, um, you know, the, the canonical example in this has been uh, the idea of a radiologist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the yeah. computer is really good at spotting certain kinds of things, but a human with experience is really good. So, you know, really the best is combination is to have an experienced radiologist and AI. And that sounds really happy, except where are we going to get the experienced radiologist in a few years when there's so many fewer people that have a career of experience? So one issue I'm particularly concerned about is um, that AI may be as good as humans at a certain point and certain tasks, but you need humans with lots of experience. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other uh, that I'd throw out for the, and well, I'll throw out that one and then I have another sure. one. Sure, well, uh, that's a great example. And, and I think um, there's a new division of labor that's emerging. And, and the radiology example, I, I mean, it, it, it's a classic one. Jeff Hinton about five years ago said, we should stop training radiologists. AI can do that job better. There are more radiologists now than there were when Jeff Hinton, brilliant guy, invented 
much of the deep learning uh, technology that we're all using, but he was very wrong about what's happening with the labor market. And a big part of it is exactly what you're saying, that, that there's still important parts of that job that humans can do better. Now, it's not so much reading the images that, that, that they both have to do, although there, there's still some room to be added there. It's that um, if you look at, at the exact job a radiologist as, as we have, there are 26 distinct tasks that a radiologist needs to do. Reading images is one of them, a super important one, but they also consult with patients. You know, I don't think you'd want a robot to tell you whether or not you have cancer at the end of the diagnosis. Uh, they coordinate care with other physicians. They sometimes administer conscious sedation, not something I'd want the, uh, the uh, robot to be doing to me. Um, so those other tasks are things that the human needs to stay in the loop for. And we looked at 950 occupations. We did not find a single one where machine learning ran the table and could do all of them. In each case, there were human parts of the occupation that humans needed to do. So what does that mean? It doesn't mean that, that machines are just gonna mass replace whole occupations at a time. Instead, there's a harder but more interesting uh, task ahead of us, which is restructuring work and redesigning it. So this is the great restructuring of work and dividing things up and saying, okay, the machine can now do parts of it, the invoices or, or reading this part of the image, and the human needs to do other parts, and we need to reconfigure it. That's a job for CEOs, it's a job for HR managers, it's a job for a lot of other people, and that has always historically taken years if not decades to play through. When you looked at electricity being introduced, an amazing technology, but it took about 30 years before you saw significant productivity benefits, not because tech electricity was a fad, you know, it was unimportant, but because it required a reinvention of the factory, a reinvention of the office to take full advantage of it. We're in a similar period now. Now, the, one of the things that, that, that's, that's striking and different is that that set of tasks that we analyzed just in 2017, it wasn't that long ago, with radiologists, it's a whole new set of tasks now because of what I mentioned earlier, generative AI, foundation models. They're affecting a lot of creative work that I used to put at the end of the line, but um, I was talking to a CEO recently and they were using it to help to, um, come up with the KPIs for their next board meeting. I was on a panel, uh, I think it was yesterday, it's all kind of blurring together, and, um, and the CEO of Vimeo was telling us that she was using it to write the press release and, and she had, had a little bit of brain block and she said it was as good or better as what her had, team had been doing. In each case though, as you're suggesting, you know, I, I would not advise just blindly turning it on and walking away. Um, these systems have too many flaws. They are, don't understand truth <laughs> very well. Um, they can uh, hallucinate uh, facts that aren't really there. Are they going to improve over time? They are going to improve dramatically over time. Um, and I think there's going to be a, a, a constant uh, evolution of them. Um, certainly right now, it would be just downright dangerous to use them without having a human in the loop. But I think even going forward, we're going to uh, develop a new job, you touched on this, uh, the job of prompt engineering. How many have heard of the word prompt engineering? A few, a few people. You're all gonna be hearing about it soon. Prompt engineering is the idea that when you work with uh, one of these large language models, you can write different kinds of queries. And it turns out that depending on how you write the query, you get dramatically different results. Even the inventors of these technologies are surprised at some of the things you can get them to do if you ask the questions the right way. And that uh, really is the piece of human creativity. And it seems small, but it's significant. And you know, for, for uh, some of your creative types, Martin, I do think they're gonna be using these technologies far more broadly on the creative side. But that creative piece is gonna be, you know, instead of having to um, first of all, it's great for ideation. I've been talking to AI artists, yes. and you know what they love about it is they can say, do this, and they get 100 examples, and I think your, your creative types will but, love that. But, but the, you know, listen to what Eric said. Um, he said at one stage, he said, well, this is for CEOs or head of HR. So, so you, you have this upward drift, um, and you have this concentration on the, the top layers who will be protected or will not be as affected. Or, oh, ChatGPT is a great or, CEO. Yeah. Well, this is this is what, but this is the really in, this is the really Thank interesting you area. You know, how far does it go? And I don't think, you know, as we see artificial gener, gen, general intelligence or developing over time, not uh, not AI itself, but as it becomes even more sophisticated, the real question that we're all nervous about or we're all focused on is how. How much of a replacement? Now, you said we're in full employment now. That may not be the case. So, so let me uh, touch over on that briefly, the, Over the Martin. coming years. And then I know Lauren wants yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'll, just, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief. Uh, 
I'm fascinated by the idea of artificial general intelligence. I also think it's quite far away, even though uh, we can mimic it, you know, Lambda. Some people thought that there was uh, AGI inside of the current models. I, I don't think there is. I think most uh, people don't. And it's still a ways off. What we do have is uh, human level or superhuman level in certain specific c categories and tasks. And there's a big agenda for researchers like me at, at the Stanford Digital Economy Lab and for, for uh, CEOs and executives to understand which, where, where the strengths are and where the humans have a comparative advantage and then sorting out that new division of labor. And? And, and, and keeping them working together. Now, there's a, 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 an instinct that I often have, a lot of people have, that when a machine gets very good at something, it's going to substitute yeah. for labor. It can. And sometimes that's valuable as with the invoices. But more often throughout history, the technology has been a complement and has allowed, allowed people to do more and new things. And one way to can tell whether something's a substitute or a complement, if it's a substitute, it tends to drive down wages. It replaces what humans are yeah. doing. If it's a complement, it tends to drive up wages. Over the past couple hundred years, wages are about 50-fold higher than they were a couple yeah. hundred years ago. So most of the tools we've invented, by and large, have been Compliments. I would just say, though, income inequality has radically well, grown. Uh, exactly. Most that, of the benefits have not gone the past, to the average. The past worker. 10 or 20 years, it's been a little different. And we've seen that there's a whole set of people that have been substituting for as opposed to complementing. And I think that's probably, I think that's the grand challenge of the next decade, is how can we use these tools other, I want, I also want, substitutes? I want Lauren to weigh in on I, some of the equity pieces, too. Yeah, so there's a, there's a couple of things that are coming out here that you know, the, the little red flags in my, you know, in my nonprofit brain go off. But I, I and I'm, so I'm going to try and weave a couple of thoughts together. Um, the, the process automation piece, right, that, that is a, in many cases, a substitute, right, and, 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 and makes things easier. I worry that there is a commercial pressure to jump to those things very quickly, mm -hmm. and to your point, exacerbates the inequality in the systems that already exist. And you said, you talked about mortgage processing. We did some work around, uh, you know, sort of financial inclusion. There's only 45% of Americans that have the documentation ready to go apply for a mortgage. 82% are actually credit worthy. So, you know, in a, in a place where you're automating those systems without human intervention, and I realize we might not be there yet, but without that human intervention, we don't create those opportunities for people to get, and the, the inequality uh, may grow. Eric, you made a point about radiologists, and it's a classic example. Um, I don't want a computer telling me that my, that my scan was difficult, but I also don't know that I need a doctor to do it. And we were talking about this beforehand, yeah. like doctors are, AI is mm -hmm. really bad at um, telling you you have cancer. Many doctors are pretty bad. Oh, so, I, I had that experience. So, so we were talking, and I wonder if there isn't a job title, yep. a new job called Empathist, and I'm going to trademark and, that. And in fairness, ChatGPT apologized to me the other day. You know, and so, I mean, it's... it's Already not, better than the yes, doctor. Yes, I'm not saying that it's developing empathy, but I mean, you know, there... Yeah. So I, and, and the coordination of care I think that's can exactly right. I think there's new kinds of jobs, and, and emotional intelligence will become increasingly to the forefront, something that humans depend on other humans for. Lauren, if I take the example of mortgage processing, actually the, one of the reasons why we can only offer a loan to a limited set of people mm. is because that's the only one commercially viable for you to do it. Now with the help of AI, and actually one of our customers did it, now you can expand your market by double the rate, and with AI you can process many other data points, and now they found out they were all credit worthy. It just wasn't economically viable. Absolutely. So this is a perfect example where uh, you, it, 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 right. it, it, it yeah. can make it can create more equitable society yeah. if you use the tools right. And right. best case scenario, you know, the mortgage processors are spending less time on the paperwork, more time to work with the people. And I'm not convinced it's going to be the best case scenario. But also, they have an interesting other pressure. I imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong here, which is suddenly because they are so much more efficient, they need more mortgages to process, so they need a larger market. Is that, maybe you can talk really quickly and then we are gonna go to the audience for questions. Can you talk about what are some of the surprises of jobs you were surprised that you were able to do as much as you were with the bots and what's one where you thought the bots would be great where they weren't so good? Um, uh, we saw bot uh, enter into practically every industry uh, uh, but what surprised me is a couple of areas. So I'll take the during COVID example. Um, NHS in the UK called us and said, we are getting killed here, working nonstop. 
Uh, and so we, we, we in, within 48 hours, we created a bot that would monitor oxygen levels on all the instruments mm. and save two hours of the nurse's time every day. Mm. Wow. At that time, it, it made a, I like to think it made a difference between life and death. So um, there was, we, 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 when we designed this technology, we never thought we'll be monitoring oxygen levels. Uh, the other thing we saw during COVID was uh, we had a lot of people had a supply chain problems, and so one intern wrote a bot for one of our customers that monitored inventory levels across 32 warehouses and 325,000 items and moved inventory levels between warehouses. Before then, it was just easier for you to order more. Uh, now, that was not the option. Save 200 million in inventory cost. Uh, these are examples of sheer vestige that we can we are able to save. This doesn't change anybody's job. It just more money to go around. Anything uh, you're surprised that the bots haven't been very good at? Um, those are the those are the human jobs, right? The being able to connect the dots, being uh, empathy, care, nurture. I don't know of a AI system that knows what the right questions are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a human job, yeah. right? What are the relevant questions? One thing, Ina, before you go to the yeah, yeah. just to sort of tease out what Eric was saying, what, what are the areas that worry? I mean, you know, you're doing very advanced research in these areas. What, what do you get worried about? Um, I, one of the things I think, I think we've all begun to be worried about is the ability of these uh, tools to generate information and disinformation at scale. Yeah. As an economist, if yeah. you set the price of generating disinformation to zero, the quantity tends to go to a very large number. So we're all going to be flooded shortly with enormous amounts of incoming uh, tweets, posts, text messages, uh, press releases, etc., that are bot generated and it's going to be a flood of sometimes very interesting information, sometimes completely made up false information, and we have to find a way to navigate that. And there are going to be bad actors that do it. There's going to be people who aren't met really bad actors, but just can't resist the temptation to do that. And we're going to have to come up with some control mechanisms to sort that out going forward very shortly. And you know, arguably one of the most important things in a society is the flow of information and getting truth to the right people and avoiding people getting polarized or, by the way, it's not just disinformation, it's also uh, polarizing information. We're already seeing some of that happening and, and I'm And is I'm it fair to that. say that the Chinese have, I mean, our experience, the Chinese have leadership in this area, is that? Is that your, do you agree with that? Well, Chinese have some, uh, they're very strong AI and lots of, uh, lots of these things. Many of the fundamental breakthroughs were actually made in the United States and then perfected on very large data sets in, in, in China and other And also countries. this is gonna get democratized. Right now it's in the hands of a very small number of companies. Um, a few of them are in the US, uh, some are in China. But you know, as this technology gets rolled out, and one of the things that I worry about, and then I promise we're gonna go to questions, is um, the idea that um, you know, one company may do this very responsibly, right. but somebody else yeah. is gonna do it. So Stable Diffusion has put out its technology as an API, open source, can do anyone it. can do it. So some Russian of the flaw. fairness yeah. things. My, 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 my take is if I, could take, if I take it to a higher level, I think we will have to figure out a way to use this technology, and here is why. Uh, world operates on growth. All institutions operate on growth. In the last 60 years, we got to the growth by two reasons, either productivity increase and population growth, yes? In, uh, I think everybody here at WEF have been talking about there is no more population growth, and ne not for the next 20 years. So there is no population growth. That means in the next 20 years, we have to double the productivity. Now let me, let me, let me put this as a question. In the last 60 years, we had internet, computers, and mobile devices to increase product productivity growth. Does anybody have an idea how to double the productivity of that in the next 20 years? If not, there is just not enough to go around in society, our social security, healthcare. None of that works without growth. And we also have some problems that we can't wait on. So there is, a, there, is, there is a direct correlation between technology is one piece. You could have a new metal, new energy, but technology is one piece of it. Driving productivity growth and that growth being able to provide enough to society so that there are no riots on the street. For me, there is a clear connection. Otherwise, this doesn't work. 
All right, I am going to, you know, this crowd, you've been generous enough to get up early on the last day of the conference. So I really do want to open it up. I mean, if for some reason you don't have questions, I'll be happy to ask. <laughs> Just a reminder, I asked ChatGPT what a question is, and it's a short statement where you're asking something of the panel, followed by them answering it. Um, so. <laughs> Anyone uh, want to be the first? If you just raise your hand, I believe they'll come around with mics, if I'm not mistaken. Someone right in front, and then uh, a gen uh, woman on the uh, far right up here. Thank you kindly for your talk. Now, you all talked quite uh, extensively on how AI is able to aid us to effectively maximize our potential. Now, my question is, where can we work together with AI, especially on white-collar jobs, to increase the potential and to further? I would, I can take that. I think 95% of all jobs, uh, current jobs, uh, the future is uh, human beings and AI powered bot working side by side. Where I'm, I'm, I'm offloading some work to my, uh, my digital coworker and say, here is my, just continuing the example, mortgage application. You process it while I do something else. When the answer comes back, I'll, here is the next set of work. You do it while I do something else. Uh, just like we all work with a computer, 95% of us will work with our digital coworkers. That's just the future of work. Um, I think, you, did you have your hand up, Camilla? Yeah, he's coming around with a microphone. And if you can say who you are and where you're from. Um, Camilla Cavendish from the Financial Times. Uh, one of my side hustles is advising a med tech company. So I'm aware that with radiography, which you mentioned, um, there's a kind of stage at the beginning where the radiographer and the surgeon are really interested in the AI, and they kind of keep an eye on it and they check it. And then there's a second stage where they just get complacent and assume that it's always right. So I just wanted to come back to Eric's point about keeping humans in the loop. How do we stop people becoming demoralized mm. Because actually, there's a danger that we lean too heavily on the technology. And even if you're finding clever ways to try and involve people, how do we actually stop people just becoming demoralized? And autonomous driving is a perfect example of this. If the computer can do everything, that's great. But if the computer can only do 95% of things in driving, that's really dangerous. And there's other professions mm -hmm. where that's the case. Eric, any thoughts? Well. Mainly, I just agree with the point that this is this is a pernicious problem, and I was actually going to use the, the driving example because one of the problems that you know Google had a, a safety driver to watch the system, and it was it was right you know like more like 99.9 percent .9 of the time, and the driver would start to fall asleep and start paying attention. So then they added a second safety driver to watch the first safety driver. So so th if this is not the path towards driverless cars where you have people watching each other, and I don't I don't know if we want to have a second radiologist watch the first radiologist, you know. So that obviously is not a, not so a so the solution. driverless car took two drivers. <laughs> uh, Genevieve. Job creation. <laughs> oh. No, I was just going to say, uh, I recently went on a self-driving uh, car drive of nine hours. I had a, a companion with me. Uh, it actually worked out fantastic, because uh, the way I thought is that there were two levels of redundancy. So it was safer than me driving alone. If, if the, uh, and I, I was able to pay more attention on conversation, on the music that was playing. The quality of conversation was better as a result of it. Um, now, if I was alone, maybe some of yeah. the concerns are valid. But in the, yeah, if I, you don't have anybody next to you to talk to, that's a different problem. But otherwise, human interactions were, were better, and it was delightful. Well, if I can just add an epilogue to that briefly. So th there's another approach. Uh, Toyota, I was talking to Gil Pratt yesterday, head of Toyota Research. Uh, they're, they're kind of flipping it around. They uh, use the uh, uh, autonomous system as a guardian angel. Mm -hmm. They keep the human yeah. uh, at the front making the decisions, and then it's the job of the system to watch if the human's about to crash, it intervenes. And, and, and that's, that, that approach can often work better. Uh, similarly, Cresta is a company that you, does call centers, and a lot of us have been so annoyed when we call a call center or whatever, and we're interacting with a bot, because they, they just aren't good enough. They, there's a long tail of problems they can't do. At Cresta, again, they keep the human at the forefront, but the AI gives some hints and suggestions that, hey, don't forget to mention this other product, or you haven't talked about pricing yet. And what we, we did an A-B test. We did a, a, a set of uh, research with them, and we did A-B test where we compared the human working with, on their own, the bot, and the, and the human and machine together. When the human and machine were together, using this 
system where the human was in the front, it did dramatically better in terms of productivity, customer satisfaction, and interestingly, uh, it closed a lot of the wage and skill gap as well. The workers who benefited the most were actually the less experienced, less educated workers. They got the biggest boost in their productivity. Genevieve, I know, has a question. So and Genevieve then, Bell, right. uh, Australian National University. All of you have talked in some way about a notion of collaboration or relationships between computational objects and humans. We've talked about humans in the loop. We've talked about collaborative things. We've, you know, Eric, you've got a notion of job tasking and pieces of the task. I guess my question is, if we think of that loop as being a bit like a supply chain <laughs> at some level, uh, one of the things we have learned over the last three years is that most loops are actually incredibly fragile. So what are the skills we are going to need to give mm -hmm. humans in order that they can actually be collaborative mm. co in these collaborative relationships, right? It, it strikes me that this is a, a very different skilling conversation than we've had in the past. So what are the pieces that we need to give humans in order to be able to take advantage of this? It's a great question. A prompt engineer is one, asking the right question, but what other skills do we need? Because the best workers are gonna be the ones that are able to harness this technology, Lauren? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, prompt engineering has had a lot of conversation here this week. I think that, you know, the, the things that humans, some of the things that humans do well around critical thinking and analysis and synthesis, those are the pieces I think where we are going to have to have humans to evaluate what comes out. You know, I, like, like everyone else in the world, I went and played with ChatGPT and I said, you know, Make me some suggestions on how to respond. This is a terrible, I, I need prompt engineering. But you know, tell me how to respond to the next Ebola um, virus outbreak. And what was really fascinating is, you know, some of the suggestions weren't that bad. They were very consistent with what we did back in 2015. But what they missed was the connection to community resources, how people fell to those types of things. Anyone with some experience in working in that kind of environment, and I realize that's an extreme in environment, but any, you know, would say, how do we in engage local community leaders, religious leaders, you know, all of those types of things. Those things is where you have to think about, in this scenario, you know, the realities on the ground plus the, you know, just the tactical actions to take. Those are places I think where we're really going to have to think about what the reskilling looks like. In the past, a lot of times our reskilling has been, you know, take people who used to be coal mine workers and teach them how to be you know, x-ray uh, radiography technicians. That, those are wholly different things. Now I think it's a question of, and we've talked about lifelong learning for years, but what does that look like? And are we actually doing that as part of what people are doing in their jobs because the technology is, training, is changing so quickly? Are there other skills? I, yeah. I think we're underestimating, I think it's gonna be enormous <laughs> amount of fear mm. that flows from this. So when you talk about skills within organizations, you know, we're encouraging people obviously to be much more agile in a, a high technology environment, but the human resources area mm -hmm. is going to be really taxed by this because we're already starting to, to hear uh, the, the worries mm -hmm. that people have and that's going to be an area of, of great concern. Talk about fear and reskilling, connecting. Uh, I think the, the, there have been, in the history, many people with doom and gloom view of the technology uh, when computers came and internet came. I think. Perhaps the mistake everybody's making is assuming that human beings are capable of doing what we, only thing we can do is what we do today, right? Mm. It's a huge mistake. It has been, they all have been wrong for the last 2,000 years. Uh, I think if you're gonna short human and their ability, you're gonna lose. That's where my bet is. So, uh, the, but we have to tackle it nevertheless, but that's where I stand. I think reskilling is the most important part in this, uh, and especially three billion people who are not connected to internet and they don't have an access to digital economy. Uh, I think we can't close this session without talking about that. Uh, I'll share our experience. We, last year, we did 2.5 million training courses, and some of them were women in Africa, uh, in Mississippi Delta, some of the poorest part of the US, and in India, and in various parts of the world. And what we saw, it shouldn't surprise us that humans are amazing, but it still in a good way surprises us. In three months, about 85% of them were, went from either flipping burgers to 150K jobs in AI and automation in three months. This is what human beings are capable of. So it's about time we, uh, look, uh, talent is evenly distributed, opportunity is not. 
the role of every technology is to make that possible. And the other thing we haven't talked about is we sort of got into it a little bit when we talked about China and the US. We haven't talked about the geographical differences because AI is, AI is going to drive, there are going to be countries where there are surpluses and there are going to be companies where there are deficits and you're going to have a huge difference in terms of development between various countries. I mean, the obvious one is China and the US, Russia, uh, India. I mean, we're going to see very great, very significant differences in the skilling and progress of AI, I think, between countries and between regions. And it's going to, to increase the divide, the digital divide. And I think education here is going to be a huge thing. Yeah. You know, which countries, you know, public education systems really adapt to this opportunity. You know, we had New York City schools say we're going to ban chat GPT from the networks, which to me yeah. oh. is the most ostrichy uh, thing one could possibly imagine. Right. Whereas, like, it's like if, you know, we didn't stop teaching math because we didn't ban yeah. calculators. We said, okay, we're going to have this tool. Uh, whereas I've heard from a couple of professors how they're harnessing it. Two great examples I heard this week. One, professor says, uh, here's the topic. The first thing I want you to do is run it through chat GPT, and we'll start from there, and then we're going to improve your essay. Another one said, exactly. you know, run this question through chat GPT, and your assignment is to tell me what chat GPT got wrong. Um, talk about education. I, I, I had a similar experience. The other day I have an 11-year-old who is a nature lover, and we have our uh, discussions on the dining table. And I told her that you can't tell me anything that I can get out of Alexa, Google, or chat GPT. Uh, and then conversation becomes very interesting. And she said, Dad, you have to ask me a different question. And I realized I have to step up. <laughs> and I, I said, OK, how do you fix the ecological crisis in Patagonia? And the conversation was very interesting. Now, we are all learning. But I encourage you, in various occasions, start having a conversation that you can't get from any of them and see how it goes. <laughs> I mean, I think that it really will, is. It will make us all <laughs> human. That really is the, the jobs thing in a nutshell is, you know, yes, some jobs are away, but that's what we need to do. We have a, you know, ecology crisis that we, with our existing technology, can't solve. Hopefully, we and the bots together can solve it. Eric, I see. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I couldn't agree more with your uh, approach towards using ChatGPT, not trying to, to hide from it, but embrace it and, and do more and better writing and art than we've ever done before. It should be a time of flourishing. I also want to underscore what, what Genevieve brought up earlier about uh, humans. Um, one of our natural strengths is, is flexibility, and we also talked about emotional intelligence, and machines don't have that breadth of knowledge, and so that, we're going to start relying on that more and more. But finally, I think that, that and you touched on this just in, in your last point there, that the humans and machines together can help solve that problem of what sorts of new skills are going to be needed. One of the things we're doing at Stanford, we have a project called Work to Vec, where we take all the jobs in the economy and we convert them into vectors. And the way we do that is we take uh, hundreds of millions of job postings and resumes. They each have embedded in them some of the activities and skills that people are looking for and the wages. And you can actually project them into a space where the different jobs are imagined different points in this, in this imaginary space I have in front of me. And you can see which ones are similar to each other, which ones are far apart from each other, and what skills are needed to get you from this point to that point, what's lapping, which, which ones have skill adjacencies. And that becomes a roadmap for companies as they are hiring, as they are reskilling, as they're deciding what new um, things they want to train their workforce are and where the gaps are, where the surpluses are. But this is something that used to be done just by gut feel. Uh, human capital is a $220 trillion asset in the United States. I mean, it's, it's bigger than all the other assets put to get better, big, together, gold, oil, buildings, equipment. But it's one that historically we haven't measured very well. But with machine learning and big data, we actually can start understanding how all these skills relate to each other. So it's, it's a new frontier that we can use to, to map our, our, our path for taking advantage of what these tools can do. And Lauren, you get the last word again. Well, I was just going to say, and that may be the tool that we need to help all these HR professionals exactly. help us think about how we transition to where we need they to have be. To be they, they now have a tool that helps them do something. Instead of with their gut feel, they can actually look at their, at their skills in the workforce and the ones that are outside of their company and understand how they connect to each we, other. We actually did that at our company. We obviously drink our own champagne. So we, <laughs> we, uh, we, Only we, in Davos do people drink their own yeah, It's not dog food anymore. <laughs> we, we, we I like used, that saying. It's we, better. We, we, we use the bots to create an individual career development plan for 2,000 employees. 
And that was only possible because we took everything else automated and say, HR is about people and career development. And with an assistance of a bot and a human being, uh, I mean, you know, we all wish we did that for every single person. What is next? How do they grow? Yes. There is just not enough time in business to do that. Yeah. Well, let me, on that point, I mean, this is a huge opportunity for HR managers, for companies to unleash trillions of dollars worth of assets. Imagine just taking that 221% better. But perhaps even more importantly, think of how many people are not in the right job and they're living lives of quiet desperation. They probably have some capabilities that could fulfill them much better, but they're not being matched to it because they're just, you know, there's not the, 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 infrastructure to put them in place. And I think that's the real value, is getting people to live up to their potential. Well, I think that's an incredibly optimistic uh, place to end our conversation. Obviously, there's so much more that needs to be said. I have a feeling uh, next year we will not just be talking about this uh, Friday at 9 a.m. Uh, we will be talking about it throughout uh, the forum. Um, I want to, again, thank you all for coming. Uh, I know your time is incredibly valuable. Um, yeah, thanks to the panel. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Real pleasure. Congratulations.